All right, well, thank you for having me here. It's been a great background and introduction kind of on the local control side, and now I'm going to take things in a little bit of a different direction, talking about the IO side and systemic therapy. Um, so I, David Raven and I were just in Paris uh, this weekend giving a talk at a conference there, and just by chance, the crypt right across from me was some of the famous Parisians, and Marie Curie's crypt was there, and as a radiation oncologist, that's a very kind of special place, right? That's kind of the birth of radiation uh, when she discovered it, and in the last hundred years, we've been all about local control and doing a good job, and, and my colleagues in Head and Neck have told you a lot about their challenges. They're, it's a lot harder life for them. They're treating tumors around critical structures, but I'm a lung guy, I'm a thoracic guy, and just to illustrate how great radiation is at local control, if the tumor is in the lung away from critical structures and we can really crank up the dose, our three-year prospective local control is 98% with stereotactic high-dose radiation. It's incredible. Um, it actually beats uh, surgery in some of our randomized studies, so it's pretty uh, interesting. The, ch the problem is, as I alluded to before, these tumors are often by critical structures, and so we can't always go as high as we would like. So we know radiation can really kill those things, but it's protecting those normal structures and doing it in a safe way. So we've been all about local control for 100 years, and we are really at this flipping point right now where radiation will go from a local therapy to a systemic treatment. And that will happen once in the lifetime of radiation, and I'm pretty convinced it's going to happen right now. And uh, it's largely because of the field we are in and with the IO therapies that are really revolutionizing the space. So it's kind of interesting to think, you know, 100 years ago, Marie Curie developed and discovered radiation. Now we have another creative Parisian with another particle 100 years later that he could put with that and synergize, but maybe do something at a bigger level, maybe systemically. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, as you know, with the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times right now, disclosures are a big deal. So I uh, do research for nanobiotics in the lab and have several disclosures as well. So what I will talk about is the immune cycle, just to give you a little background on the immune response, how radiation can really turn the tumor into a vaccine, if you will, um, and then where the nanoparticles can fit into that and the ongoing studies that we think would be uh, good to look at. So I want to start with this cycle, this, this immune slide, because it shows you the immune system, it's a cycle, right? It starts with antigen release. The antigens are picked up by dendritic cells. They go to the lymph nodes. They prime T cells that go throughout the body. It's a clear cycle. And right now, immunotherapies are very hot. Uh, just this week at World Lung, four new studies came out that were positive in New England Journal of Medicine. I mean, the field is changing very fast. It's very exciting. But the challenge is you got to do these in the correct order, right? You can't do step two and five all the time and not do step three. It's just not going to work and prime the T cells like we need them. And the beauty of radiation is radiation gets this started. We hit the tumor, kill the tumor, it breaks down inside the patient and produces this vaccination, if you will, that can uh, s subsequently set up a T cell response. And so my work is I work with companies to figure out where to put their drugs. So I'll go through their whole portfolio of all their drugs and figure out how they fit with radiation, if they should be before radiation to improve the stroma, if they should be with the radiation to help stimulate a better immune response, if they need to be right after to help the dendritic cells, or maybe longer for help with memory. So I spend a lot of time in the lab and then clinic trying to figure out where drugs fit. So you might have heard about this abscopal response, the immune response radiation can do. So I d drew this illustration to kind of show what's going on here. So we hit this tumor with radiation, and we kill it, and we open it up, and we release the antigens, right, these mutations. These get picked up by antigen-presenting cells. They go to the draining lymph node, and then that draining lymph node activates these uh, CD8 cells. CD8s are very important. These then go back throughout the body, and they come into the tumor we are radiated. And if you don't have an immune response, these T cells will not go to the tumor and your tumor control is much less. So when your patient's immunocompromised, even you give a heavy, hefty dose of radiation, it won't control the tumor as well. But the neat thing is these activated T cells from treating this tumor can go throughout the entire body, right? And they can actually go to other areas that you didn't even treat and address that disease and potentially shrink that, which is what we call the abscopal response. So it's Latin for you know, no dose getting a response outside of where you're treating it. So that's the hypothetical that we're interested in doing more of. So the PD-1 drugs that you've heard about kind of revolutionized everything in our space. So the tumor cells upregulate these receptors, PD-L1, and as the T cells get older and tired, they express this, and it's kind of like a handshake. And if they make this handshake, it won't kill it. It says, I'm a good guy, leave me alone, I'm one of your buddies, don't kill me, and it won't kill it. So we're making drugs now to block this interaction, and they're working, 
and they're working about 20%, but the good thing is that they're working in almost everything we're treating. All the tumors, uh, except a few, like pancreatic, are not working, but they're working in my field, lung. Just yesterday, the very first small cell lung data came out. I mean, we haven't had any biologic advances in small cell <laughs> maybe 50, 50 years, and now we have, as of yesterday, positive PD-1 data in small cell. I mean, it's just really, really impressive. So what's going on right now is you hear about these hot and the cold tumors. So some tumors have a lot of mutations, and they're a little bit more antigenic, if you will. Melanoma is the poster child at the side. This is where the immunos are working quite well. But we have a lot of tumors where it's really not working as much as we want. And so the hope and the thought is, could we use radiation to help with this and prime up this immune response? And could a nanoparticle even push that further, if you will? Um, so is this concept real? Does it even make sense? So you can take a mouse, and you can take a tumor and you put it in a mouse, and then you irradiate it, tumor goes away, and then what we do is re-challenge. Then we re-inject tumor cells in the mouse to see if it grows. And if it won't grow, it's because it has memory. Just like you get a chicken pox vaccine, you have memory. If you have memory, you won't produce a tumor. And when we do that, nine out of 12 mice will not develop a tumor, which is pretty cool. Now, if you take the same tumor and you kill it outside of the animal, hit it with radiation, kill it, and then inject those dead cells into the mouse, and then look at memory, only one out of 10 gets it. So there's something special, if you will, about killing a tumor in a patient where it can break down, go to the draining lymph nodes, and stimulate this immune response. This is the tumor beforehand. The good cells are the, the CD3s that are uh, green here. And you see before, not many. And afterwards, there's an influx of these immune cells that can come in and help kill the tumor. So I'm going to. The biology really on why radiation produces an immune response hinges around um, sting and interferon response. So we damage DNA, as you saw in the illustrations. This becomes cytoplasmic DNA, which activates sting, which turns on these interferon response genes, which produces this big interferon response. So there's a couple steps in the process, but this readout of interferon being turned on is the hallmark that we're after. The more interferon you get, the stronger that immune response is going to get. And so I'll show you some stuff in the future that looks at that interferon on response. Um, so here are cells in tissue culture with the nanoparticle put at higher doses with radiation, and you don't see this interferon response at all without the radiation. But as we go up in our doses of radiation, the radiation, of course, is increasing that interferon response, and the nanoparticle's pushing that, and it's boosting that further and further as we go higher in dose. So this is in cell culture. So next we looked at, um, this is not my work actually, but then the next it was looked in mice where you t inject the tumor, then the particle, then the radiation, and then you're looking for this interferon response, uh, which tells you it's going to probably hopefully produce a better immune response. And here with the particle compared to without radiation, uh, you're going from here to here. So you're getting some more of that interferon signaling and response, which uh, pushes us to think about an immune response. So the main test we do in mice to really figure this out is we put two tumors in a mouse, one we treat, and then one we're looking at, which we call the abscopal tumor. So here you see two tumors. This one's getting treated. We don't care about that one. We care about the other tumor. That's the one we're interested in to see what it's doing. And here's the tumor that's being treated with radiation. Here's the radiation response. The nanoparticle boosts it down, separates the curves. But this is the one it didn't get treated, which is quite interesting. You're almost seeing a bigger response in the tumor over here that's not treated when the particle is on board. And so again, that's an elucidation of this tumor activating T cells that travel throughout the body and can go to other places. Um, OK, so now, now we're looking at the immune cells from this. So again, with the treated tumor, you're getting an increase. These are the CD4 cells. I'm going to go to the CD8s because these are the most interesting. Um, so in the tumor that you're treating here with radiation, when you have the particle, you get an increase of the CD8s, the cytotoxic T cells. So that's great. But pr most interesting on the tumor that's not being treated, you see the CD8s going up, which is really nice. So it proves they're going throughout the body. Um, this is another immune cell that, for macrophages that also increases in the other side. Um, and so now human data, right? So we're moving up the chain from cell line to mouse to humans. So this is human data, nanoparticle uh, with radiation versus radiation alone, and looking at the CD8s. The CD8s is really kind of the hallmark for getting an immune response and getting them into the tumor. So you have 23% um, with radiation alone versus 53 with the particle on board. 
um, also the PD-1, this is the marker that blocks that immune response, and that's going up too because once you produce an immune response, this goes up to slow it down. And this kind of begs the conclusion, well, why don't we combine nanoparticles with PD-1 drugs, right? PD-1 drugs are revolutionizing the field right now, and this gives nice evidence uh, that this will likely work better in, in the combination. So back to you know the immune cycle. I told you it's immune cycle it needs to go in a certain order. Now that we understand that the immune system is so important, and really this is a realization we've just had in the last few years in our field, everything or a lot of what we do historically in oncology is kind of wrong immunologically. So a lot of us are working to try and fix a lot of the stuff we've done historically in the past. And I'm just going to use breast can cancer as an example for this. So breast cancer was uh, the, the dogma several years ago was the radical Halstead mastectomy, which is you just get bigger and bigger margins. You take the tumor, you take all the lymph nodes, you get really big aggressive surgery and just cut everything out. And so that's what's kind of uh, in vogue in, uh, in breast cancer, um, regardless of cosmesis. It's, gotten, it's changed since then, but this mindset of being very aggressive and taking all the lymph nodes uh, is still largely a part of the treatment today. So what do we do with breast cancer? Sometimes we'll give um, chemo beforehand, which will then take out the immune cells. And then we cut the tumor out, right? So you remove the tumor, but you've removed the T cells. And then they cut the lymph nodes out, now you can't prime an immune response because <laughs> you don't have lymph nodes. And then we come in with the radiation at the very end when there's no tumor and there's no lymph nodes. So we can't do our, do our work. We can't produce an immune response. And so we're kind of set up for failure in this situation. So what we're trying to do is re, redo a lot of the way we do treatment. So we're doing some trials at MD Anderson where we just take that radiation that's done at the end and put it right at the beginning and hit the tumor with radiation, make it a vaccine, and then you can cut it out, and then you can take the lymph nodes out. And this might be a nice uh, area for nanoparticles, right? Radiation up front, do your particle, produce that immune response, and then you can cut it out and do your standard treatment. So you guys have probably heard about protons, right? It's something that comes up. I know Memorial Sloan Kettering is going to be getting protons. We are a big proton center at MD Anderson. And just to illustrate the confusion about that, sometimes uh, I had a patient literally come in to me and say, I want futons, not photons, <laughs> which, of course, futons are bad, right? But she got mixed up and thought she was saying protons. She thought she wanted protons. So what is the rage about protons, right? So Protons, it's a particle, and it delivers its radiation energy quite different. So all the work you've heard about today is with photons, and the photon distribution comes in like this and then has a bit of a tail. So it exits, it doesn't stop, it keeps going. Protons come in, deliver all their energy, and it just falls off like a cliff. We call that the Bragg Peak, and there's literally nothing beyond that. And you, it's really nice for things like this, cranial spinal. So here's a young kid retreating the brain and the cord, and you want to protect this kid because there's the heart, the liver, the intestines. You don't want to blast the kid's young organs, right? Um, and so here you can see you can get full dose, and it just literally stops. So that's a good thing for protons. Now, I was just at the World Proton Conference in Austria, and they're, cha they're having tra challenges with protons because it's very expensive. Our machines are about $150 million. At MD Anderson, we'll get the first carbon facility in North America, which is $300 million. And they really don't have great data that it's that much better in terms of outcomes. So they asked me to give an immune talk on why we could add immune therapy to make particles better. And I had one slide for them, and I just said, nanobiotics. <laughs> you need a nanoparticle. The particles make the most sense. And I work with a lot of stuff. I do intratumoral injections. I work with cell therapy. I work with all the IO agents with a lot of the companies. But out of everything that we have out there, the data is probably the best for a nanoparticle. And the reason being is we go up higher in the periodic table, um, and protons are here, and carbon is over here. As you go higher with these higher energy particles, they will work, work likely much better at stimulating a, a robust immune response and an interferon response once it gets hit than the photons that we commonly use. So a great area for research. Um, we'll hopefully be doing some trials with that, looking at protons versus photons, and then carbon really ups the ante even more. And these places that are doing this are desperate to find something to show it's better or it's got a unique property, right? And I think the particles are great for that. So that's a whole other area to tap into. So what's the path forward? So obviously local control, we talked about that. So, you know, radiation with the nanoparticle. And then what about the combination with immunotherapies, with the PD-1 drugs? Can we give that and really push towards systemic control, which is an area of great interest and I, I think uh, will be something we need to look at. 
Um, so we want to look at different particles, heavy ions versus photons. Also take advantage of the injection. Now, um, intratumor injections were a little bit harder a while ago, but now they're kind of becoming in vogue. There's a lot of agents sting that we're doing this, and we do this a lot at MD Anderson. So everyone's getting more comfortable with it. But you can take advantage of that because you're injecting this particle. And so what else can you take advantage and in, inject at the same time, right? And sometimes these antibodies will last a couple weeks. So the nanoparticle helps activate that immune response. But if you could put something on to help the dendritic cells afterwards, you can, you know, thinking about what to inject with the particle could really push it even further on the immune response. Um, and then what agents, obviously, to give systemically with the nanoparticle, right? What else do we want in the blood? CTLA-4, PD-1s, what are the other drugs that could make this immune response even better? And those drugs are all over right now in oncology and being investigated heavily and causing a lot of excitement. So nanobiotics to explore this is doing a couple uh, alliances with different groups or research initiatives. Uh, I have one at MD Anderson where I'll be playing around with the particle with the immune question with PD-1 drugs and different immune drugs. They have one at the Providence Center as well and right down the street here or Cornell with Sylvia Frementi and Sandra DiMario. So they got, they got a lot of the best labs all competing with each other. So <laughs> we'll, we'll see what we come up with. Um, so what I'll be doing with it is I have the model of PD-1 resistance. So I'm sure you've heard about these PD-1 drugs. So I developed this model in my lab uh, some time ago and it's a lung cancer model and what's, this is how it grows and it gets res responsive to PD-1 drug by itself, but the resistant subclone version grows faster, more aggressive, and you put the drug on it, it doesn't respond. So what I do for a lot of companies is I test their drugs in a PD-1 resistant model, and we're trying to make this very hard to produce upscopal responses and find good hits. So I'll be playing around with it in that model. You know, there's a lot of interesting areas where we can go to the local control side. There's a lot of tumors we were challenged because as you saw with head and neck, it's by critical structures, esophageal, Big same thing, it's right by the heart, it's in the esophagus. Lung cancer, it's by the mediastinum. Mesothelioma are these big tumors that line the whole pleura, and it's really hard to treat everything because the volumes get so big. So we can't go high on the dose, right? So our dose goes low, so if we had a way to inject something to make that radiation more effective, that's a great area. Pancreatic is kind of the pinnacle of a tumor we don't do good with, and it's because of dose escalation. The pancreas is right by the bowel and the duodenum, and we know if we could go higher, we could kill it, but we can't, you're gonna perforate the bowel, and so we're really stuck in the struggle of trying to give enough to the tumor but not hurt the patient. And so something like this would be great for pancreas. On the systemic side, that's pretty much all of our diseases we treat. Everything needs better distant control. Esophageal, lung, meso, all the same ones. But you can add other things as well, breast and, and colon cancer as well. So if we can show this value proposition, and they're nice, it's a nice start already with the sarcoma stuff, but if we can show the systemic side of it, then there's a lot of areas to go. So I'm just going to end with some of the trials that we've been thinking about here at MD Anderson. So, so I run the ImmunoXRT initiative at Anderson. So there's 65 radonks at Anderson, and we want immuno strategies in every disease we treat and every stage, stage one through stage four, because every disease either needs better local control or better distant control. So we're working on a lot of different strategies. And so pancreas, as I kind of illustrated, is a good one. We were thinking about stages where you do chemo and then you randomize to radiation versus radiation with the particle uh, to get better local control. That's definitely an area that needs some help. Um, Dan Gomez does a lot of our meso trials, and so we were talking about this, doing nanoparticles to the areas of the bulk tumor where you just can't get enough in. It's very hard to do that radiation. Uh, we pioneered trials between us and Memorial Sloan Kettering where we irradiate the lung while the lung's intact, right? So talking about a situation where you gotta protect that lung but also kill the tumor, and so this would be a nice uh, concept to go there. We'd probably also maybe look at some proton questions. So I think that's my last slide, and I'd be happy to take any questions.